Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. Deneen Milner is one of those writing superstars that if you have not read her work, I guarantee you have seen her work everywhere. She is a veteran in the writing space and has uh, focused on celebrity memoirs and journalism, and she's just been all over the place. She has a phenomenal new novel that we talk about today, and we talk about her amazing journey from being a journalist to writing nonfiction to writing fiction, and we cover all kinds of bases. Join us over at storycraft.cafe so that you can know when we have live events coming up and you can join in on the conversation. Now on to our great conversation with Deneen Milner. And we are live in the Storycraft Cafe. I am your host, Hank Garner. Sincerest apologies to everyone who showed up yesterday for this interview. We had some technical difficulties. I accept full responsibility for that. Anyway, um, that is neither here nor there. We are here today to talk to Deneen Milner. Deneen, I, I've been thinking for a couple of days uh, how to introduce you and uh you know, you have just been all over the place for so many years in the writing community. And um, we're we're here today specifically to talk about your brand new book, One Blood. What a what a trip uh, of a book. And, and I mean that uh, in the sincerest uh, form. Deneen, there are books that you pick up and you just kind of fall into and you just you you want to rush to the end because you're just enjoying the story so much. And then there are books that you you read a little bit and then you sit with the story and you sit with the characters and you kind of stop reading because you want to absorb it and you want to feel all the feelings and you don't want to let these characters go. And this is one of those books where some you want to rush through the end because it's just kind of the the rush of it all and others you you just kind of want to live with. And this is one of those books. One Blood is an amazing read. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate being here with you. And I appreciate you and your your companion there. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to keep him from, from barking. He sees leaves. There's there's a little breeze outside. And when he sees the leaves moving, for some reason, it's just an occasion to bark. And so I'm wow. trying to keep him from being was, the loud uh, one. Yeah, we were talking just before we went live. We have a dog that looks just like that, but ours is like eight pounds. She's a she's a lap dog size, but I um, love it. Yes, gorgeous. This, is, this is Frankie. Hi, Frankie. <laughs> oh, Deneen, I like to start the show with a fun question. Sometimes it kind of sets the tone for a conversation. And one of those questions that I love to ask people is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, oh, goodness. Um, (laughs) It was when I was in the ninth grade and my physics grades were horrible. Too terrible for me to be able to be the architect that I intended on being. Mm. My dad kind of pulled me to the side and he was like, hey, say, man, um, (laughs) it's going to be hard to be an architect if you can't figure out how to make the building stand. So, you know, like maybe you could think about being something else. And so it's like, you know, what is it that you want to be? And I said, um, at the time we were sitting at the table in, in, in our kitchen, I grew up in long Island and it was about five o'clock and there was this legendary newscaster named Sue Simmons who, um, 
she had a, a show called Live at Five and she would interview celebrities. And right at that time that my father asked me that question, New Edition was being interviewed. And like anybody who knows me knows that I wanted to be married to Ralph Tresvan. So, you know, like it, it was a very, right. It was a very easy answer for me. It was, I want to be Sue Simmons. I want to be a journalist so that I could sit down and talk to Ralph Chesvan, of course. Right. And, you know, though that was broadcast, I was able to go back that next day and find ways to be um, Sue Simmons, which is what my father ordered me to do. Like, go, go tomorrow to school and figure out how you can be Sue Simmons. And so there were a few programs and classes and after school activities that I, I hopped into, all of which gave me entree to a scholarship with my local newspaper, Long Island Newsday. And I interned with them in the summers. And it was then that I saw reporters going out and chasing stories, coming back and reporting them and writing them. And that's when I fell in love with writing and understood um, the first the first my freshman year of college, I got a an assignment from Black Collegiate magazine to write. Um, a story for the magazine and I got $500 for it. And I, that came in my, my mailbox at college about, uh, about a week into my being a freshman at Hofstra. That was real money for a freshman. That was big money. And I was like, Oh snap, I can do this. <laughs> right. Right. That, yeah. That's uh, so you, you started with a love of journalism. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. Okay. I've, I've, I, over the the many many author interviews that I've done, uh, I've uh, gotten to know quite a number of authors that began their careers in journalism. And and one thing that always fascinated me, and and maybe I just see the world weird, but um, there, especially in a in a big market, you know, you're talking about Long Island, you're 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 talking about the 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 New York metro area, um, a an event may take place and you could have a hundred reporters show up to cover the same event. Mm -hmm. And each one of those, you know, the basic facts are all the same, you know, whether it's a a car crash or a politician, you know, whatever politicians do, Mm -hmm. um, the, the basic facts are the same, but each individual journalist will have a different perspective because you're seeing the story through her or his eyes. Right. So you're getting a little different flavor to the story, you right, know, right. through that. Right. Um, but you're also seeing it through the perspective of the newspaper, right? Sure. So sure. Like, I hadn't thought of the, that. Yeah. Newspaper has their own sort of identity and voice and um, politics. And so, you know, like the, you're going to get a completely different story from the New York Times than you would the New York Post. Right. From the Daily News, from Long Island Newsday, they all come at it um, with a different voice, a different sort of, uh, you know, like way of telling a story and the way that story ultimately ends up on the page. And so that was my background. I started out as a political reporter for the Daily News. I worked for the Associated Press first as a general news reporter and then got recruited and a political reporter and then got recruited by the Daily News to be a political reporter. And so I would go out and cover like like Rudy Giuliani and um and Mario Cuomo and we all travel those were the days those were the days (laughs) (laughs) we would all travel as a team and each and we would help each other with stories you know like we would be in a car and you know like the guy from Long Island Newsday would be driving and then I would be riding shotgun with the daily news and then somebody from the New York Times would be in the back and someone from the post would be on the other side in the back. And all of us were going, we're competitors, but we're all going to the same place and doing the same thing, understanding that our stories are going to be completely different. You know, I'd never thought about that layer of the, the voice of the news organization that factors in as well. Um, how, as a journalist, do you learn that, that, uh, that corporate voice, uh, you know, that, that institutional voice? Let me just talk to my dog real quick. Franklin. Frankie. Okay. 
Um, <laughs> how do you de- tell me the question? Yeah, one more the, time. Sorry. How do you how do you become accustomed to that institutional voice, the the particular voice of the New York Times or the Long yeah. Island? You know. Oh yeah, it's it 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 is a a skill. It, it's it's a skill that you have to acquire from writing consistently, from having editors who are very clear about what the voice is and help guide you toward that voice. Um, you know, when I first got to the Daily News, I very much wrote like the Associated Press, and that you know, like you had to have just the facts, ma'am, because that would go out on the wires, and everybody would use those facts to sort of uh, incorporate into their own stories and then pile their voice on top of it. And so at the Daily News, I had a significant number of editors and writers that I followed and loved who had a very specific voice to them. And I was able to at first mimic those voices and then eventually learn how to create my own within the parameters of the Daily News. And so some of the, um, the, the, the writers that I really loved the most that I wanted to be like, like I love Jimmy Breslin. I loved Pete Hamill. I love Dennis Hamill. Um, all of those, those, those gruff New York, um, uh, uh, voices, uh, that, that just would get into the grime and the dirt of New York city and pour that out onto the page. I wanted to sound like them. And so I would just read them religiously. Like, like a Bible and just study how they told a story and then try and incorporate in that into my own. And that's how I, that's how I got my voice. That's how I learned how to um, tell a story. You know, it was just through journalism, but that was the way I did it. Well, as, as someone who is uh, a fiction writer and, and a nonfiction writer and so much more. We're going to touch on all that in a minute, but, but right now we're talking, you, you wrote this novel. And so we're, you know, you've got your fiction writer hat on at the moment. Are there tools that you picked up from journalism that you now lean on or, or pull out of your toolbox as a fiction writer, e- even though, you know, we think of these two as f- two fundamentally different things, but we, we've talked about the, the way a different person's perspective, you know, comes into your reporting and writing. Are, are there things that you learned back then that now help you as a fiction writer? Absolutely. The chief among them is research, research and figuring out what the facts are. Right. So one blood is full of very specific historical things that happen to these three women that are I'm exploring in the book. And a lot of research went into that. My background as a journalist was to know that this was before Google. It was before, you know, um, cell phones. It was before you had to go to the library and look at, you know, microfiche and you had to know what you were looking for. You had to call, you figure out who's, who you needed to talk to as a source and then call, look through the yellow book and like, or, or special books that, you know, they would have with experts and then call them on their phone. And if they weren't there, wait for them to call you back. And at the Associated Press, I had to do at least four to six stories every day before 3 p.m. And they had to be factual. They had to have at least two to three sources. And I had to have it written by the all four to six of them by three o'clock. So I'm a beast when it comes to, to research and understanding how to find the information. Um, and so that definitely went into it. And then uh, just, again, figuring out a uh, voice and how to attack a story. So with the daily news, all of the information and the juice is in the lead. It's the very first paragraph. The very first paragraph has to be able to catch the reader right away to make them want to read three to 400 words. Right. And so I can't start a story without that, that the very first paragraphs being on point. And so I could go through a story and write, go through a book and write the first paragraphs of all 15 chapters before I actually write a whole chapter because that voice 
is so important and, and attacking it in the in that very first paragraph is paramount so that you know, oh yeah, I need to keep I need to keep turning the page on this one. And then when you get through that chapter, then you get to the next one. It's like I want to keep reading because oh my God, look at how this chapter started. So if right. you look at one blood you will see me attacking the page basically in the beginnings of each one of those chapters. That is directly um, uh, hearkening back to my job as a journalist in the newspaper at the daily news in particular. There are, and and I love what you just said. Um, There are news articles now that, that you'll read and they pay so much attention to that beginning of the article. And then as you kind of get down toward the bottom it's just kind of stuffed with superfluous mm-hmm. stuff and you you mm-hmm. find yourself just trailing off and yeah. you just never get to the bottom so so while that first introductory paragraph needs to have that punch and needs to pull you in you also need to know how to finish the article. And I, I, I find that Absolutely. lacking and, and especially um, and, you know, we can argue about whether technology has been good for news and publishing and all of that um, all day long. But there, there does seem to be this rush to get things out there and to kind of fill up a word count. And there's almost becoming a lost art to not only opening well, but finishing well. Absolutely. And and what you said about one blood is absolutely right. You really pull readers in at the beginning and, and really give us something to hold on to. But you also are um, crafting it all the way through. And there, there's not that trail off that happens. So how do you, uh, how do you not only begin well, but end well? And I, I think that's becoming a lost art as well. Agreed. And I think uh, in terms of journalism, I think that um, we are so attuned to social media and figuring out something in a matter of 140 characters or less right. or, or having the attention span for only 140 characters or less or a small paragraph on an IG post or a heck on TikTok. You, if you're not saying it, then it doesn't count. Right. Um, you know, and that we've gotten away from the ability to actually tell a good story from beginning, middle and end. And, um, you know, a big part of storytelling is being able to tell the beginning, the middle and the end. And if right. you can't do that, then you're kind of screwed. And I think with journalism these days, because the attention spans are so small. And then on top of that, like factor in AI, because I see at, you know, places where I've long been a fan of the work. I see the work that's being done now and I can tell that a computer is writing it. I like don't ask me how. I just can tell. Yeah. And well, it comes, it comes back to that voice that you talk about a lot of times that absolutely. It, sometimes it can get close. It can throw in some pertinent phrases and things like that, but it's just not exactly there. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 quite frankly, I think that, you know, some of these folks are using AI to write the story and then just going in and changing a few things around to make it their own air quotes and then passing that off as a story. And, you know, like we are just going to get to the point where we're not going to have a, um, you know, like a, a, a next generation of incredible writers because that is what everybody is focused on. It's how to tell a story the quickest way possible. Um, and then, you know, let the computer do it. And I don't think that I'm being, um, you know, over, I'm, I don't think that I'm overacting when it comes to this. I, I'm seeing it with my own eyes as a journalist who actually pays attention and a writer and a novelist who pays attention to writing and the way that people put stories together, sentences together. I can tell, I can just tell. Yeah. And it's scary. Well, I, I, I think my personal opinion is that we're going to have two tiers of of uh, of writing that are going to come out. You're going to have the the mass market stuff and then you're going to have the writers that appreciate the AI tools and use them as tools kind of in the same way that that you or I would bounce ideas off a writing partner yeah. or something, mm-hmm. but then use those suggestions 
to to help with creative blocks or something. But right. I, I think the the human story is always going to be paramount. Let, let's hope so. Anyway, I hope so. I do yeah. hope so. Yeah. Um. So you you talked about that um that kind of local news legend um that that was an early inspiration um. I could see where, you know, you're in a big market like that and it's a competitive news industry. And I could see where someone could be perfectly happy building a career uh, off of that. Um, but you were there for a time and you springboarded to other things. What was your uh, what was the thing that 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 drew you out of that and kind of opened your your horizons? Oh my goodness. So I wanted to be Jimmy Breslin. There was just no other way, you know, to describe it. I just, I I just, I was the black Jimmy, black female Jimmy Breslin. That's what I was, I was going to do. And then one day I wrote a piece for, we had this section called Thursday, spelled T-H-E-R-S-D-A-Y. It's like the women's section and it ran on Thursdays. And I was one of the main writers for that section at that time. I was an entertainment journalist by then. And I wrote this story about this book called The Rules. And it was written by these two women from Long Island who, um, you know, were writing all of these different rules for how women should engage with men. And, you know, it's like, you know, men should, I mean, women Women should, you know, act dumb on a date so that a man, you know, is comfortable with her or, you know, like don't accept his um, date until he asks you out three times because, you know, like you don't want to seem desperate. And I just read this book and it was just everywhere. Right. And I, I read this book and I was just like, this book would never work with any of the black men that I date because they would, <laughs> they would like they would just move on to Shanika. Like I would I would never have a man if I if I did these. So I wrote a story basically saying that. And my my editor created, put it on the front cover of Thursday, and she created a mock book cover that said rules for the sisters. How do black women find true love? And she had one of my coworkers dress up in a Superman suit and pose on the cover of this mock book cover. And I come in love it. late and, you know, with a bagel and coffee, it's like 10 o'clock. I was supposed to be there at nine and I'm like just sauntering in, like getting my day started. And I, <laughs> I listen to my voicemail and there's 14 messages from people talking about this story that I didn't even know she was going to, you know, I, I hadn't seen it already. There were 14 messages, 12 oh, wow. women saying, I went to Barnes and Noble. I went to Walden Books and I can't find this book. You know, like, where can I find rules for this? Is, is it out yet? And I'm like, what are they talking about? So I open up the newspaper and I see, you know, my crazy editors made the entire, like, you know, 6 million people reading this newspaper think that this book exists. And then the 13th, That's hilarious. Right, right. So the 13th was from this editor at Ms. Magazine who was like, I love your voice. I love the way that you write. You know, you should write for us. And the 14th one was from an editor at William Morrow saying, hey, would you like to write the Black the Black Black rules. And by three o'clock that afternoon. Well, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> so by by three PM I had a book deal for fifty thousand dollars. That is wild. Is that not crazy? And that, that is how I entered the book, the book market. I, I had a month, exactly a month to write that book. And the first two weeks I sat around watching Oprah, eating Hagen dazs and just, you know, like doing everything but writing. And then I, I actually wrote it during the course of two weeks and talking to my parents and my in-laws at the time, my husband at the time, my friends who were married at the time about, you know, like, what was it that convinced them that to be couples and to to marry one another and to be in love together. And that's what ultimately ended up being the book, The Sisters Rules. And it was a huge, huge success. Like time and people and Newsweek followed me and my, I, it was my fiance 
fiance when the book came out, but we got married like maybe two or three weeks after the book came out. And all of these these uh, people followed us to our honeymoons across literally in Europe um, and wrote stories about the girl who used the rules to get a man. And I was just like, child, I had this man way before. <laughs> <laughs> I had this man but a lot for a while. <laughs> exactly. Well, if that's where you want to go with it for your story, knock yourself out. You're but, right. um, but that is that is how I got into the book book writing field. And then um and then uh, the the book was so popular and people were so enamored by me and my then husband that one of our friends at the time, her name was Valerie Wilson Wesley. She's an incredible writer. She she was doing a bunch of mysteries at the time. Very, very yeah. popular. Um, and she saw me doing a uh, an event, a book signing event. And she she saw me and my ex-husband walk in and she says, you know, you two should think about doing a book together. And, and my ex-husband was like, no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm a journalist. I'm a Pulitzer prize winning education <laughs> reporter. I'm not doing anything about relationships. This is, you know, beneath me. And she says, well, I'll pay you $10. I'll bet you $10 that if the two of you decided to, if two of you put together a proposal about sort of like a, how you guys how you work in your relationship and you write it from a male's perspective and a woman's perspective that it would, you would sell that book. And so we sat down and put together a proposal, sold it within two weeks. And we, we went and we paid Valerie her $10 the following year. Um, and we, that yeah. is amazing. Yeah. And so my husband, my ex-husband and I wrote six books together. And then from there, it was just off to the races. So I wrote my first 10 books while I had a full-time job and babies. Um, I, so, I, I, so he lowered himself to... He lowered to, to do these books. <laughs> he lowered himself to do these books with me, and then ended up being a, a pretty prolific uh, journalist. I mean, a pretty prolific author in his own right. I think he's up to like sixteen or seventeen at this wow. point. Wow! Himself, some of them are New York Times bestsellers, um, and uh, you know, like that's I. I wrote those first ten books while I had a full time job. I moved from being a journalist to being a magazine editor eventually, and I went from. Um, as a newspaper, I mean, a magazine called Honey. And then I became an editor at Parenting Magazine, where I started my journey as a mom expert. <laughs> and then uh, and then sometime in 2005, I just left the actual full time job behind, came down to the South and started writing books full time and doing, you know, essay work for a couple of magazines. And that's how I got here. Wow. And, and all that in you're only 25. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, Denise, you alluded to a couple of things that I just want to touch on for just a second. When you're writing nonfiction, um, a lot of times you will get a book deal on a proposal yeah. for a book that has not been written yet. Yeah. Uh, and fiction is very different. Um, you write an entire book and then try to sell it. Right. Um, and you have a lot of, uh, you know, just on the surface, I'm, I'm not, this is no value judgment whatsoever on fiction versus nonfiction. That's not what this is. But um, it would seem like if you're trying to come up with a nonfiction book, it's a whole lot easier to brainstorm proposals. And if this one doesn't sell, just come up with another proposal than it is to write an 80,000, 100,000, 120,000 word book and take an entire year of your life and then maybe nobody wants it. Um, you would think, but you would think, least, but you've been on both sides of this. So yeah, can you weigh yeah. in on kind of the differences in the in the book world? Absolutely. Um, you know, I so I for those who aren't familiar with the nonfiction work that I've done, I did a lot of celebrity memoirs. Yes. Um, and we're going to talk about those in just yeah, a minute. Right. <laughs> and in order to have those books sell, I, I would have to write the proposals and proposals are really, really hard to write. They are not the full book, but you have to think the whole book out and then you have to write two to 
three of the chapters up front. You have to, um, in order to write the synopses for, so you write the first three chapters, two okay. to three chapters. Right now, they, they're looking at three. Um, and then you have to write a, a synopsis for each of the chapters that will fill out the rest of the book. And in order to write those synopses, you have to actually interview the person about each one of those different things. That takes a lot of time. So by the time I finish writing a proposal, I can write pretty much two thirds of the book without talking to the person again. Right. Mm. Because that's how much work we've done in order to wow. get the proposal together. You have to think about, um, you know, who the market is, how how you how you plan to market the book and promote the book, um, what your what your expertise is in it and write all of that down. You have to be able to, um, you know, just tell do an overall sort of uh, 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 picture of what the book is about and who you see that audience, uh, who it's catering to. It is a lot of work and a proposal can take me anywhere from, you know, three to six months, depending on the access to the person that I'm writing the book with. And then you might do all of that and still not sell the book. Or the person that you're doing it with might decide that's not enough money for me to do this. So I'm not going to do this now. So I've, I've spent all this time interviewing this person, you know, massaging the package, writing the materials and, you know, like I don't, you know, sometimes that deal to write the proposal is I'll write the proposal, I'll write the proposal and then you'll give me a portion of the, you know, like the book deal that you get. Sometimes at some point I had to say, hey, this is so much work. You have to pay me for the proposal and then also give me a portion of the, the, the fee that you ultimately get because this is too much work for me. It's, it's right. too much um, for me writing the novel outright um, and it not having to be perfect, but having the novel, you know, together enough for you to be able to give it to an editor and then to be able to look at it and see the potential is way easier than writing a proposal any day of the week. I'll do that. But I managed to sell one blood off of 44 pages. Really? I did. Well, well, I I think you your your history and your back catalog probably spoke for you. It definitely um, helped, but no one had seen this kind of writing from me. Like this was a right. novel. I you know, like I'd written novels before, but they were very commercial. This yeah. one is way more literary and no one had ever seen me write that way. And the and then the forty four pages of me telling what I had to say, it it sold to eight different countries in 44 with just 44 pages. That's, and I, I want to come back to one blood in just a minute, but I, I want to ask you um, when you've written a number of celebrity memoirs um, and then you, you also have written books like the ones you did with Steve Harvey that are like part memoir, but part topical. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say instruction, but like that, the act like a lady, think like a man, yeah. um, which, you know, became a massive hit for yeah. Steve. Um, you know, Steve was was f way famous before that book. I mean, yeah. he he was a stand up comic. He had, had the Kings of Comedy tour. He had a, a sitcom, for yeah. goodness sake. And right. he, right. you know, hosted Showtime at the Apollo for a right. 100 years. Right. You know, Steve was was doing OK yeah. before that. But when this book came came out, it's almost like he had a second career where oh, he yeah. was a megastar oh, yeah. after that. Oh, yeah. um, how did that come about? And and you, you touched on it a little bit a minute ago, but when you start talking with someone about doing a book with them, what is that that collaboration process like of kind of figuring out what it is they want to say and then replicating their voice? But, you know, bringing all of your talents to the project, that has to be a minefield, I would think. Thank you for saying bringing your talents to the project, because so many people think that writing, um, co-authoring or writing for someone else means that you're just sort of sitting around and taking dictation and then oh, you know, 
putting it into a book. And it's so much more right. than that. So the book with Steve Harvey came along because I'd done a, I'd done a story on Nene Leaks for Essence Magazine mm-hmm. as a freelancer. And then an editor reached out to Nene Leaks and said, hey, I think your story is worth a book. Would you consider writing a book? And that editor um, reached out to, or Nene Leaks reached out to me and she said, is this serious? Who is this editor? And is this, you know, the thing? And I was like, no, she's a very serious editor who, you know, like has done a bunch of different, I think I'd done The Vow with her by then, which was a novel I wrote with two of my friends. And so when um, Don Davis was the one who convinced Nini to do a memoir, Nini came to me asking for access to an agent and, and asked me if I would consider writing her book. And I said, yes. And so that editor, we ended up writing the, writing the book for a different editor, but Dawn was my editor for a couple of other projects. And when Steve Harvey was looking for a writer for his book, I think Dawn was the one who pitched the idea to Steve because he used to do this. I don't know if I, I haven't listened to his show in quite some time because I I'm just never in the car to listen to the radio, but, um, but he was doing this, uh, this segment called the strawberry letters. Strawberry letters. Right. And, um, and she asked him if he would do sort of like a book version of that. Like just, uh, she liked the relationship advice that he was giving for strawberry letters mm-hmm. and asked if he'd want to do a book. And he said, yes. And then he was looking for an Atlanta based writer and Dawn knew me. She knew my work. She understood my ability to get things done quickly. They, they had to have the book written in six weeks as a journalist. I can, you know, make that happen. Um, and uh, so I got the, got the deal. Um, the way that we did it was I would go to his office every day and I would, well, when we first started, uh, we, I sat down with him and I was like, let's come up with, you know, 25 ideas that you want to express in this book. We will pick 17 of that 25 and that will be the basis for these 17 chapters. And then with each one of these ideas, let's think about what the, what the main takeaway you want the reader to take away with. And then we start, and then we just did that. Then I would take each one of those 17 ideas and I would show up at his office first thing in the morning, like 10 o'clock would be the latest I would get there, usually nine. And then we would sit and talk about this, whatever chapter we decided we were going to work on for the day. I would ask him a bunch of questions. He would give me a bunch of answers. I would take that, that what he said, transcribe it at home, write a chapter, and then go back to him the next day with the chapter and the new synopsis that we were going to work on for the day. He would read the chapter, tell me some things that he wanted to change, things that he liked, things that he didn't necessarily agree with. I would bring, you know, my ideas to it. He had a couple of other women in the office who were also giving their ideas on how women think and then him, you know, approaching it as like, this This is not necessarily the way that men think. And so this is what you, you know, how you should approach this. And we would go through the chapter and then we would go through the next chapter and do do the same thing over and over again. I would go home. I would fix the one chapter. I would write the second chapter, take it back. And then we would just systematically, methodically went through each chapter that way until we were done in six weeks. Wow, that, that was an intense six weeks. It was an intense six weeks. And one should never, ever, ever <laughs> sign up to do that, ever. <laughs> it, it, that, that was a project you could not tackle while also working a day job like you did no. in the in the beginning of your career. That right, just, right, right. So you have well, to have the freedom I, and the flexibility. Absolutely. And so when I moved from New York to Georgia, it was the best decision I ever made for my my family, first and foremost, because I wanted to be the kind of mom to my children that I wasn't able to be while I was working a full time job and then writing through the night. Right. Like I would see my kids on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, I would spend most of the day shopping, you know, grocery shopping and cleaning the house. And then Sunday we would be in church all day. And then, you know, like I'd have a couple of hours with my kids and that would 
was absolutely not working for me. And so we moved down south and I got rid of my day job. I got a column with Parenting Magazine, which was the magazine that I'd been working with at the time. And I was making more money writing the column than I was sitting in the office for eight hours. Um, And then I, you know, and I just have to write one column a month. And then the rest of the time I got to dedicate to freelancing and writing books. And so that afforded me the ability to write his book. And then on top of that, I moved serendipitously to Georgia and he was looking for an Atlanta writer. How about that? And, yeah. and, and you get to be in God's country on top and of I get all to that. Be in God's country. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, Deneen, you, you talked about writing commercial fiction um, and, uh, and you talked about how one blood available everywhere. Now it's your favorite local bookstore um, is not um, like the other novels that you have written. Yeah. Um do I understand correctly that part of the inspiration for this book was um, a personal story, a personal discovery of yours that kind of led to some of the the pondering about what the story became? Yes, actually. Um, so One Blood is about three women, one, a woman who a teenager who gets pregnant, has a baby and has that baby taken away. The second about the adoptive mother who raises that baby and the third about that baby now a mother in her own right and sort of the thread that um, ties the three of them via adoption, motherhood and sort of this womanhood and trying to figure out how to navigate um, a world that isn't always the nicest to them because they're black women in America. So there's just all these things that they have to deal with um, and come through on the other side um, as they, they reach to freedom. So what does that look like? Um, but I am an adoptee and I found my, um, my adoption papers while I was snooping in my parents' room when I was 12. And I never told my parents that I, um, that I, I, I hadn't told my parents that I knew I was adopted because I was afraid I was going to get in trouble for going through their things first. And right. Forth. But also because if it was a secret for them, then I needed to be okay with it being a secret. Um, mm. and, and, you know, like now as a grown up, I can look at it and feel like maybe I just decided not to tell them because I was, I was afraid of what the consequences could be. Like maybe they'll be so angry at me that they'll send me away. Or maybe, um, you know, like I will experience yet another um, sort of tearing away of uh, from a parent. And so I just was afraid to say anything and never did until my mom passed away without knowing that I knew. Um, But the night that the night of the day that we buried my mother, I told my father that I knew and he gave me some scant details that he knew about um, where I'd been left on a stoop. And four days later, they came looking for a daughter and found me. And then they just decided that that was the day that my life began. Right. was when I, when I became their daughter I and mean, that was good enough for them and it needed to be good enough for me. And so I wanted to, um, with one blood to explore who the mothers are or were for a person like me who um, was raised by a mom who was, um, she could be, I don't want to say harsh, but she was very no nonsense. She's Southern. She's from South Carolina. Right. You, you understood how you raise kids. They were mm-hmm. seen and not heard. You were supposed to be a kid, stay out of grown folks' business. And this was, you know, there was that separation of church and state. You just did not do it, right? Like, right. You just let your mother be your mother, let your dad be a dad, and you were a kid. And that was the beginning and end of it. Respect your parent. That's it. Um, Period. Right. Done. <laughs> um, and I wanted to explore how she became that kind of parent. And I wanted to explore how I got to her in the first doggone place. Right. Um, And there were so many different things as a mother in my own right 
that I wanted to ask my mom, right? Mm -hmm. My mom passed away when my second daughter was just three weeks old. Um, My older daughter was three and I had only been a mom for three years. My mom became a different kind of person, which I explore in in One Blood. And I wanted to know why she became this other, this different kind of person who now was talking to me like I was a woman and not like I was some kid who didn't have the right to an opinion or a say, right? And um, and I just became a different kind of mother because I knew what it felt like to not be heard just because you're a little person, right? And I didn't ever want my kids to feel that way. And so I just chose to parent them in a different kind of way. And I wanted to explore why that was. I wanted to explore all of the questions that I had for my mom that I never got to ask her because um, she passed away. And then all the questions I had for my birth mom because I never knew who she was. And so, you know, it's, it's personal and that kind of way. And there are some things in the book that are true to things that happen in my life, but it is very much a work of fiction. It's um, uh, this sort of generational saga um, is, is something that, that we don't see as often um, anymore. Uh, it, in a lot of ways, this is a coming of age book, or I, I kind of felt it that way. In in and what I mean by that, um, I feel like that coming of age books, when you when you when something is classified that way, it's uh, it's you know kind of this angsty um, adolescence, you know. But in reality, we're always coming of age. Absolutely. You know, we're there are different cycles in life where we are a child, yeah. and then we are an adult, and then we are grand grandparents and and we're always morphing and changing and becoming someone and through these these three generations that we see in this book we're seeing this constant cycle of of birth and renewal and renewal again and it's it's such a timeless story I'm so glad that you saw that because that's exactly what that's one of the things that I wanted to do was to to show how that coming of age story and how that ultimately affects who these women become, right? Right. Like we're coming to them as women, but you're seeing their background, their, their, their rearing, their, um, their environment and all the ways that it poured into who they ultimately become and whether or not they're okay with that. And then what they do to change it or to sit in it or to, um, you know, or to, to, you know, to fight it. Right. And so um, very much so it's a coming of age story of Grace, Lolo and Ray and what how that ultimately affects who they become to other people, particularly their own daughters. You you said that you sold the book on 44 pages, I think you said. Yeah. Um, what was that pitch um, that resonated with people? Because I, I can totally see it with the finished product. But what was the what was the hope of the finished product that that people caught on to? It was definitely sort of the the connection of these three women and whether or not nature, what what plays more in who we ultimately become. Is it nature or nurture? Is it right. physical or spiritual? Is it, um, you know, does this blackness have anything to do with it? Does womanhood have anything to do with it? What, and if it does, what what is that? So it was like how to explore um, that nature and nurture and how that ultimately um, colors your womanhood, your motherhood, your significant otherhood, um, and how that all sort of melds together based on past experience and history. And so, um, you know, the first 44 pages literally are the same as what you see in the book now. Um, I think oh, wow. it's the first two chapters. Okay. So, um, yeah. And, and that's what they were able to see. And then my letter about, you know, how personal this book was and then the synopsis of where, where I was going to go with it. 
Wow. How long did the did the drafting of this book ultimately take? Um, you, you talked about some of your other projects and how crunch time comes in. But this this feels different yeah, from, yeah. from a lot of your other work. So what what was the the process like on on telling the story? Yeah, up until I wrote One Blood, the longest I had to write a book was nine months. That was the Charlie Wilson um, book, Charlie Wilson from the Gap Band. Yeah. And, and I felt like I, I'm living. This is, you know, this is nine whole months to write a book. I don't even know what to do with myself. Let me stretch and, you know, like crack my knuckles. Um, but you can drop all kind of bombs in nine in nine months. I'm just saying you really can. Exactly. Exactly. Charlie Wilson joke. I hey. <laughs> Don't drop the bomb on me, baby. You drop the bomb. That's a great song. That is classic. a classic. Classic. Timeless. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, ooh, when Charlie, when I did the Charlie Wilson book and I interviewed him and he sang Outstanding to me oh, and Yearning for stop. Your Love. I just I had to stop him and say, OK, I'm sorry. I know that I'm writing your book, but I am a fan right now. Right. You can't just be singing yeah. outstanding in my ear <laughs> as Charlie Wilson and expect <laughs> me to be OK. I'm like, right. <laughs> right. You got to put the Charlie Wilson on pause for a second. Right. Exactly. And right. understand. Oh, my God. You just say <laughs> yearning for your love in my ear. <laughs> um, it's so funny. <laughs> But with one blood, um, the 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 beauty of it was that my editor, Monique Patterson, understood me. She understood what I was trying to say, and she gave me the understanding, grace, and most importantly, time to do what I needed to do. The book was actually supposed to come out in 2022. OK. And um, and there, I had to rewrite um, a huge chunk of Ray and Ray was the, the book out of the three that I was most uncomfortable with because it was most it tracked most to my own life and and the things that I went through as a young journalist in ninth, in the 1990s. Um, Ray is a television producer, but she is living a life as a young mother and a wife that I kind of lived at the time, but I didn't make the same choices that Ray did. And um, and for, for those that haven't yet read the book, Ray is the younger of the of the three. Right. She's the daughter. Yes. Right. So she's the she's the one who. um you know, is Grace's baby who was taken away and the right. daughter of Lolo, who was the adoptive mother who raised her. And she is the like Grace was 16 when when we met her or when we got to the climax of her story. And Lolo, we get to see from age like three all the way to like age 60 something. But Ray is the one whose life we're seeing in real time at right. 34 or something like that. And so, um, yeah, and I had to rewrite a part of Ray's story to sort of fit into this thing that I was trying to do, which was to show why Lolo ultimately became the mother that she was and to um, try to sort of have this bonding moment with Ray. Um, so it, 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 it turned into something. I did something that I didn't necessarily like and Monique caught it and she was like, I think this is what you need. I think this is the way that you should approach this. And I agreed with her and I needed more time to get that done. But, you know, the story was very much, um, I had the synopses, right. But sometimes I would sit down to the page and the character would just be like, mm, I'm not going left. I'm going right. I'm going to go down the corner. I'm actually going to climb that mountain and then I'm going to sail off of it. And, and I just had to go with that, right? Like with a, with a nonfiction book that I'm writing for someone, there's specific parameters that I have to stick with right. and because it's not my book, it's theirs. And I can guide and I can massage and I can make suggestions, but ultimately the book is theirs and they get to say what it is they want to say. Um, but with my with one blood, 
it was all me. And I had to sit down and really kind of understand where I was going with the book, be very clear about it in my synopses, and then break every rule that I had for myself as I was writing. Wow. Um, do you see yourself writing more in this vein uh, in the future? You, oh, you've... Yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just yeah. Um, I loved it. So it was hard as hell. Yeah. Um, but I just the idea of being able to tell my own stories. I have the bug now, you know, like I don't mind telling other people's stories. There's good money in it. It, sure. you know, it did me well. I, I was able to create a life as a, an editor and as a writer that, you know, most people dream of, but are not able to touch. I was able to do that. It put one kid through Yale. The other one is almost finished with George Washington. Um, you know, like I, I it bought my home. It, you know, it helps my dad. It's, it's done a lot of good for me and it's yeah. opened doors for me, um, you yeah. know, as an editor, as a children's book, publisher but the idea of being able to tell my own story in the way that I see fit and to let all of these ideas and these dreams that I have in my body that just are constantly coming to me being able to pour those onto the page for my own benefit is absolutely something that I must do it's critical it's urgent I love it. I can't wait to see what comes next. One Blood, available everywhere now. Go visit your favorite local bookstore. And if you don't have a great local bookstore near you, we'll put links uh, in the show notes where you can grab it from Amazon or from Audible. I'm, I'm assuming that uh, there's an audiobook treatment of this. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell I you. I have not gotten to hear it yet. Is Is it amazing? The, I've been listening to it now. I'm like, I, I know it seems narcissistic for me to turn on my no. own book and listen to it, but oh my goodness. So Tina Lifford, if any of you are familiar with the show Queen Sugar, she's like a really famous actress. She's a character actress, but in Queen Sugar, she played Aunt Vi and she's, you know, like a very Southern woman based in yeah. New Orleans. She is, she reads the Book of Grace. Bonnie Turpin, who is a legend in the um, in the voice and the audiobooks industry reads the book of Lolo and then a new a relative newcomer uh, Janice Abbott Pratt reads the book of Ray and when I tell you I'm in uh, the book of Grace right now with Tina Lifford reading when I tell you how beautiful it is to hear her read these words. You know, like the Book of Grace is set in rural Virginia in the South. And when we were interviewing actresses for the part, a lot of women came um, with a sort of idea of what they thought a Southern voice should sound like. Right. And it would sound like a caricature. So like I said, I was raised by a South Carolinian and a Virginian. And I'm very familiar even though I was raised up north, very familiar with a Southern accent. It's not weird to me. It's not, you know, odd to me. It is the way that and my you can spot spoke. a put on accent a hundred miles away. Exactly. And yeah. so I was like, we can't, we cannot have my book with the pretend Southern accent. I, I right. just can't do it. And so uh, a, a very dear friend of mine happened to know Tina Lifford. She represents her as her publicist. And we begged her to ask Tina if she would be interested. And she said yes and did it. And oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. If you... If you are into audiobooks, this is one that you want to listen to in audio. It's gorgeous. We would definitely put the link uh, for that as well. Um, Deneen, you know, if we know anything about publishing, One Blood has been off of your desk for for a while now as it goes through all the, you know, machinations of publishing and, and all of that. What are you working on these days? I have the next book that I'm working on is called What They Created Was Love. Love. I actually was a McDowell fellow this year and okay. was able to go um, and sit in a cabin for, for three weeks and just 
had people bring food to me and there was a piano in, in my particular cabin. So I taught myself how to play a couple of songs off YouTube uh, videos and videos and sat with, you know, my candles lit a fire cause it was hot. It was um, cold when I was there in February and March and just sit and just really, really do the research and think about who I wanted this character to be. And this is another book. It's like a companion book to one blood, but it's about a woman who actually ends up in one of those, um, those homes for unwed mothers and what it's like for a black woman to be coerced into giving up her child and how that affects her family and her livelihood going forward. And so that one is called what they created was love. I can't wait to, to uh, get a hold of that when it comes out. Deneen Milner, um, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you're up to and dig into your massive back catalog and follow along with, you know, all the, the news coming up, where's the best place for people to to find you online and, and connect? Sure. The best place is DeneenMilner.com, D-E-N-E-N-E-M, like Mary, I-L-L, and like Nancy, E-R. Dot com or I'm always running my mouth on Instagram. So I'm at my brown baby on Instagram um, and you and on Facebook, Deneen Milner. So I'm I'm constantly talking about what I'm up to, what is you know happening in my life as a writer. Um, but DeneenMilner.com is where you can get all of the latest. Great. We'll link up all those to make it easier for folks to find you. Deneen, please come back again and and let's chat some more. It would be my heart's joy. Thank you so much. This was so wonderful, so thoughtful. And you know, Charlie Wilson and the Gap Band, we are buddies now. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) Deneen, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. That's our episode for today. There's so much more to come as we talk to authors about the craft of writing, but also the business of publishing. Be sure to subscribe to the StoryCraft Cafe podcast in your favorite podcast app so that you never miss an episode. The StoryCraft Cafe is made possible by Dabble. Writing a book is challenging. Your writing tool should not be. Dabble is an easy-to-use online writing tool packed with helpful features that allow beginning novelists and published authors to create amazing stories. Visit us at dabblewriter.com and start your free trial today. Thanks for listening.